I'm Alan Lazar from the MIT Sloan School, and I'm delighted to be moderator of this panel. This is the first of three sessions on China's emerging growth model, and this is a, an up-close examination of Foshan City. Uh, I'd like to start with one of Sam Palmasano's observations at lunch, that you know, if you just look at the macro economy, if you look at the total story of the Chinese economy or the global economy, you miss what's going on you need to look below the surface. And if you look below the surface of China, you have to recognize that there is a set of national plans, but there are also 200 plus big cities that are really driving the change in, in China. And if you want to understand the transition from the growth model that brought China from where it is to the growth model that will carry it forward, you have to get below the surface and see what's happening in a specific city. So that's, that's the whole purpose of the day. Uh, there are three adjectives that I would like to apply to the uh, FGI study of Oshan City. And I've, I've had the privilege of watching this study over the last year and reading various pieces of it and commenting on pieces of it. The first is, I'd say it's fascinating. Uh, for a Westerner, we, we know China as Beijing and Shanghai and maybe Guangzhou. And we don't know the other 170 cities. And we don't know the other top 20 cities that are really making the difference. So here's a city of 7 million people with $12,500 per capita income. Right, it would be a very interesting city if it wasn't overshadowed, in a sense, by the ones that are known on the outside. Um, it's also a fascinating laboratory for the interaction between state and market. It's clearly been state-led. State-led in a way in its growth, but most of the real action has taken place in the private sector. Uh, and there has been a lot of learning in terms of the back and forth between state and government leadership, the building of infrastructure, the building of enterprise, the attraction of migrant labor, et cetera. So it's, it's a fascinating case to understand. Uh, the second adjective is it's illuminating. Uh, the way that Xiao Gang and his team have looked at Foshan City is very illuminating. There's a historical timeline. There's an explicit focus on the economic productive sector, on the social sector, and on the physical or environmental sector. And the struggle, the struggle that Foshan City has had in keeping a balance between those three as it builds itself up. And, and I think the way it has adapted to each successive phase of that struggle. Also the fact, and this is a central theme, that this is not state or market. This is state and market. Uh, the state very clearly understanding how the need to link the productive system into the global economy, the need to engineer down the transactions costs of being part of the global economy, but also providing a lot of the core infrastructure. So it's, it's, it's an illuminating story there, and I urge you to look at the lenses that the FGI team have developed in looking at Foshan City. And then the final adjective I'd use is, is prescient. I think, I think it really foreshadows the future. If you look carefully at what's happened in Foshan City in the last decade or the last five years, my sense that my, my friends who are China experts, I think, would, would uh, reflect this, that you're in Foshan's present, you're seeing a lot of China's future. So many of the struggles that have been gone through at the level of this pioneering city are basically what's going to happen with the implementation of the third million renovation. So you say, how's this going to work? Take a look at Foshan. Uh, we have uh, five wonderful panelists. And of course, we lost 15 minutes uh, due to the prior timing. So we're going to uh, run things fairly quickly. And I'm going to change the order of the panelists a bit. So we have Margie Yang, who is an important part of the Foshan story. Uh, she's the chairman of SL Indu Industries, uh, the world's largest shirt maker and probably fabric maker that goes with that, and also a key player in Foshan City's development over time. We have um, Xu Ping who is the deputy director of the Foshan Sino-German Industrial Service Area Management Committee. If you could put all of those words together, this is a mixture of governmental and non-governmental development agency that puts together some of the fabric of services 
required to make a town and city vibrant, industrially, and socially. Uh, then we have um, Fred Van Yam, a professor from the College of Economics at Jinan University, who, as I understand it, has a very long historical perspective on the development of enterprises in China. Then we have Anne Fiorini from a School of Public Policy at Singapore Management University, who really looks, can look at this comparatively from a social so systems perspective. And then I'll finally turn it back to Shagan, who will pull it together. So first, we'll hear from two participants in the Foshan story itself, Margie Yang, who's really the business leader side of this. You understand? No. First of all, it's very depressing to be told that your assignment is to talk about the history of a place. I'm so young, why do you want to pick on me? Pick on somebody older. You've lived this history. You're revealing my age. So, it was 25 years ago that our company first went to Fosan. Um, well, our company was started at the time of um, its 35th anniversary for our company. So, our company is also almost like um, a player in Deng Xiaoping's economic plan, and we just follow our role as he scripted it. So in 1978, we started compensatory trade. And um, we're in the textile business. So we started by doing this um, bartering for um, shirt orders for export. And then in 1988, around that time, we decided that we had to replace the Japanese source of fabric because the Japanese, we make for customers such as Polo Ralph Lauren. And I'm sure every one of you probably own, except the ladies, owned one of his famous Oxford shirt. That fabric used to be only available in Japan and a very select region of Japan because it's a very difficult fabric to make. It's an Oxford made from a 22 ply yarn, very slippery, very difficult. But we decided that we have to go to China and replicate that fabric because the Japanese production was dwindling down. So we were looking for a place. Now, I'm Shanghainese, so in 1978, when as Cal first started in China, we went to, of course, the middle of the kingdom. We went to the Yangtze area. I'm glad Victor Fong's not in this room because otherwise this is the time that he will kick me. Loyal Cantonese don't like to hear that the middle of the kingdom is around the Yangtze area. But geographically, I believe that I'm correct. Um, anyway, so we started exploring in the southern part, which is closer to Hong Kong. And we were told at the time that there was a state-owned enterprise that was available around the Fosan area that they were willing to sell. So we went there, but unfortunately, by the time we got there, got to Fosan, it was already sold. So we were directed to go to a place called Gaoming. Nobody had heard of this place. And I, I'm sure nobody in the audience, even though you're here, talking about Fosan, you've not heard about Gaoming. Well, Gaoming is a part of Fosan. Um, when we drive there, if you have sort of, um, remember those ferries that's really on, um, you have to pull yourself over it with a rope. That's how we got to the Gaoming. There was no bridge at that time. And um, so, why were we so interested? Because my father said, one of the prerequisites for a location for Eskel is that you must allow me to bring in as many university graduates that we want. Because in those days, Puko is a concern. So that was a prerequisite. And Gongming, having a very small population, said, you can bring all the talent you want. And that's how, in 1988, we found Gaoming and decided to create our domicile there. 
Today, we have 30,000 people in Gaoming. We have spinning, weaving, knitting. We treat 30,000 tons of water a day, so you can imagine you know, um, um, the size of the fabric operation. And we also have uh, apparel manufacturing. And um, we have been able to bring in a lot of talent. And this is what I try to explain to Party Secretary Wang Yang when he came to visit, that we are no longer competing based on labor, but today we are competing based on management ability and talent. So let me stop at that. Great, great start. And I think the, the point of competing on, on conditions rather than labor and the willingness to accept you bring in the experts. So now we'll turn to Xu Ping who can talk about how you, in a sense, have gone to the next wave of raising the conditions, raising the level, raising the skills within, within the city.
，我站在不同的时期，结合自己的产业特点，啊，每一年啊都要多次啊，去带领人民企业啊去国外开拓市场，啊，比如啊去南非，去俄罗斯，啊去中东，啊去日本，啊，所以我们的民营企业在佛山的发展可以说心无旁骛，啊，就是一心一意的啊搞生产。这个也是我们佛山市长所讲的，啊，佛山的老板，啊，这个只要在佛山啊置业，啊，他就会啊一心一意的去发展做他的生意，他的市场啊可以说在这里可以走向啊啊这个全球啊走向全国，啊，因为佛山啊不论是在这个啊这个装备制造业，还是在这个呃。家电以及陶瓷、纺织、食品啊、电子等等，行内行业比较齐全，可以说我们日常生活使用的产品，你在佛山都可以找到。所以佛山的产业发展啊，市政府、佛山市政府这几年啊，都是在千方百计的帮企业解决问题啊，资金不够了。我们有金融三年发展计划，啊，市场开拓，新兴产业培育，啊，佛山应该讲在这方面啊，为企业的发展，啊，做了很多的这个引导和贡献。这是第二个，第三个，我想再介绍一下，就是我们在发展城市建设的时候，佛山市政府连续九年，我们搞了这个城市可进入项目。引入了投资四千多亿，民营企业占了三分之二，啊，将近三千亿的投资。我们把这个交通枢纽设施，啊，污水处理，啊，垃圾填埋，啊，这个这个发电，啊，等等，这些公益设施的，呃，公建项目，拿出来向民间开放。可以说，这个是也是我们这次十八届三中全会提出来的。我们是以市场来配置资源的，啊，所以佛山的民营企业感觉到发展的空间巨大，啊，呃，佛山的情况我就介绍到这里啊，不要说大家。呃，首先很感谢呃大会邀请我啊，我今天就佛山这个市场和政府的关系，我想谈几点意见。我想从那个广东珠三角的发展这个角度来看佛山。首先第一点呢，我觉得佛山的模式其实也是珠江三角洲经济发展模式的一个缩影。呃，但是佛山更典型。这是佛山形成一个市场和政府良性互动呃这个关系奠定了一个最初的基础。大家都知道，广东珠三角的经济发展模式核心有两点，第一点就是把中央当初一九七九年给予广东的特殊政策灵活措施，最核心就是财政包干，这一点呢。通过减城、减政、放权，啊、呃，这样的形式下放到基层政府。从这个时候开始，调整政府和市场的关系，啊，这是第一。第二呢，就是以开放来促进改革，啊，通过发发展那个外向型的经济，首先向香港开放，啊，发展外向型的经济来推动外资企业。
和三支企业，呃，外资企业和民营企业的发展。所以从这个角度来说，呃，珠江三角洲这个这个发展呢，成为了全国经济发展的和长三角一起的这个两个经济驱动轮啊。这个过去三十年。珠三角的经济呃发展年均增长超过百分之十六，啊，这是珠三角的经济发展的模式。佛山相比较，啊，佛山的特点是什么呢？它是呃从一开始发展外向型经济，接着转向了在发展外向经济同时转向内源经济，它更关注国国内市场的开拓。因此，在这个方面呢，它的民营企业更加发达，啊，它对市场国内市场的开拓，它所建立的这个市场体系更加发达，啊，我们从几个数字可以看得到，第一，它民营企业非常强大，它占那个佛山 GDP 百分之六十，它的乡镇企业，啊，它们它的百分之八十五的乡镇企业。啊、呃，都是专业证啊，都都是专业证，它是证啊，是专业证啊。另外呢，就是它的专业市场、批发市场更加发达。从那个整个珠三角的情况来看，它的市场经济的发育的程度，如果我们和东莞来比的话，它更加发达啊。因为像东莞，它主要是外向经济啊，大进大出和国际接轨啊，这是第一。第二点呢，就是从呃那个零九年以来，零九年以来我们可以看到呢，就是随着全球金融危机啊，广东珠三角的经济发展呢也受到了呃很大的冲击啊，很大的冲击。在这样的情况下，因为佛山它的是民营经济占主体，它在民营经济和市场经济的推动之下。政府的政府职能做了一个更进一步的调整，这个调整呢，我们可以看到呢，在两个方面。第一个方面叫做放水养鱼，啊，就是减政放放权，啊，通过一系列的减政放权，使得我们的企业企业能够保持更大的活力。我们可以看到，这首先是企业的要求，市场的要求，在市场企业的推动之下，政府。那个进行了呃行政体制体制的一系列的改革，这些改革包括啊零九年佛山呃那个顺德的大步子啊大步子改革，然后是隔个镇的叫做减政强政减政权政呃那个政府的政啊强政就是呃加强那个政一级的这个这个事权。同时呢，就是佛山市政府呢进行了行政体制的改革，比如说推动了三市登记制度的改革，啊，这一系列的改革呢，呃呃，那个把很多的审批制度啊都下放了或者精简了，呃，根据有关统计呢，它的呃行政的精简率达到百分之四十八，啊，好像南海呢，呃，它的村的呃经济很发达，它就进行了一个、呃、管理职能。和经济发展智能的分离的这么一个改革，通过这一系列的改革，它所谓叫做放水养鱼啊，就是进一步的让市场来推动经济发展。第二个方面呢，呃，它又去扶持呃那个经济发展，扶持企业。我们如果归纳一下呢，有那么几个方面：第一，扶持那个民营企业啊，呃，比如说零九年。呃，那个亚呃，那个全球金融危机的时候，他出台了十大的措施，去扶持这些企业，呃，形成了一套完整的扶持民营企业的这些政策体系，啊，另外呢，就是引导产业转型，最典型的就是陶瓷业，啊，陶瓷业的那个发展，这个时间关系我就不谈了。另外呢，就是佛山的民营经济最重要的就是那个专业证。因此呢，他就推动那个专业证建立这个公共技术的服务平台，啊，通过公共技术平台的建设，来使得专业证能够升级转型，啊
同时还有构建了一系列的平台，比如说中德啊，刚才徐总呃他们的一个一个平台，还有一个很重要的就是广东金融高新技术呃发展区这样的平台，另外还有一个就是开放一些公共事业的呃领域给民营经济的发展，所以我们可以看到呢，就是政府通过一个放放权。一个扶持啊，通过这两个方面去调整市场和政府之间的关系，使得佛山的市场经济的发育比珠三角的其他地方更更快的往往前走了一步。这是第二个观点。第三个观点呢，但是我也要想说啊，就是从广东来看。啊，佛山虽然是在这方面走前了一步，但是佛山和整个广东珠三角一样，在经济的持续发展和转型升级方面呢，仍然是面对着严重的、严峻的挑战。啊，可以说，目前佛山仍没有成功的跨越那个中等收入陷阱。呃，我我的观点主要在哪几个方面呢？第一，佛山的产业转型仍然是任重道远啊，因为佛山它主要是陶瓷啊、那个家电啊、呃纺织啊、食品等一些就是耗能比较高啊、呃污染比较厉害的这些产业，现在的产产升级转型才刚刚开始，这是第一个方面。第二个方面呢？就是我们从中国经济发展的情况来看，未来的发展呢，要经济增长方式要转变，转变经济增长方式最关键的是一个拉动内需，啊，其中的核心就是消费，啊，也消费。但是我们从，不好意思，我们从这几年的情况来看呢，就是佛山的经济其实和珠三角的经济一样。也是有一个增长放缓的一个过程，啊，比如说我们看那个佛山，它的 GDP 的增长就是从过去几年的百分之二十左右下跌到去年的百分之八点二，啊，比他们原计划去年应该达到百分之十，他们也那个经济的增长没达到预期的目标。从经济增长的三大拉动力来看，啊。从出口，从过去的百分之呃二十左右，从过去的百分之二十左右来看，啊，是吧？呃呃，过去的百分之二十，呃，现在那个呃去年是负的百分之三出口啊，固定资产投资，投资的拉动。在过去几年也开始从百分之呃十八左右下跌到百分之十二左右。我们看那个消费，这消费的拉动呢，也是就是总体的情况来说，也是不是很理想。也就是说，它的经济增长的呃方式的转变，和整个广东珠三角一样，仍然是面对着一个挑战啊。这是呃呃第二根。第三个根据呢，就是那个政府的改革，还是缺乏一个顶层的设计啊，所以那个像顺德啊等等这些改革，它的大步子改革，它缺乏了上下的配套，呃，经济、政治和法律等方面的配套，因此在实际操作中呢，也存在不少的问题。谢谢大家。that excellent historical perspective. I think we see a lot about how Foshan built up the fabric of public and private to reach this mid-level, and we, we started to see some of the struggles of transformation. Uh, so far, we've been looking at this largely as an economic miracle, but it clearly also has a social and environmental aspect, so on that point, I'll turn it to Anthea Rini. This is an absolute
absolutely fascinating story and one that I think is not very well known. And I'm very glad that Film Global Institute is doing this, this project because this is a story I think all of us need to know more about. Um, not least because of its broad lessons for thinking about not just the future of China, but the future of Asia and of the world. I want to suggest that in addition to the conversation we've had so far about the roles of, in talking about state and market, we're talking so far only about government and business. But there's a third set of actors that also needs to be brought into the conversation, which can be referred to as civil society, the people sector, NGOs, who are also crucial players in this story. Um, and I'd like to pick one particular component of the, the Foshan story uh, and the broader development story and spend a little time thinking about the kinds of challenges that Foshan is now facing that it will have to, to solve in ways that are very different from the way those challenges have been solved by other cities in the past. And I want to talk particularly about environmental sustainability. So far in this conference, we heard a quick mention from Michael Spence this morning. Um, it's in all of the Fun, Fun Global Institute literature about the, the environmental issue is not a minor issue. It's a fundamental survival question. The management of natural resources is becoming extraordinarily challenging, partly because of population size, partly because of the improving lifestyles of China and other countries. This is not a dilemma anyone yet knows how to manage. And it will not be possible for China to grow its way out of this problem the way the West did, because there's no place left to dump the negative externalities. We do not yet have a system for deploying the technologies, even the ones that already exist, that could deal with this set of problems. This is a governance innovation challenge of a kind and a severity that I think the world has never seen before. So everything that Fushan has accomplished faces a fundamental threat, an existential threat, because no economy prospers if you don't have soil that you can use, if you don't have water you can drink, and you don't have air you can breathe. And those are the sets of challenges that all cities are facing, not just Fushan. Um, so if you cannot continue to externalize costs, what are the models you can use for dealing with these kinds of challenges? And it isn't just making Foshan livable in the sense of can you attract people to live there, it's literally can it be livable over the long term? Can you live there? Well, there, there's several models for dealing with these kinds of environmental threats. Um, in the West, there have basically been three. One is the government requires you to clean up and use best available technology, a command and control system. Very economically inefficient. And what counts as best technology is something that is constantly changing. Government regulators cannot keep up with it. Second approach is to use economic incentives. We heard this morning, let's put a price on carbon. Excellent idea. It's not happening. And the idea that those kinds of price mechanisms are going to be institutionalized fast enough to transform economies the way they have to be transformed so that we actually pay the real cost of the natural resources that we're using seems a little optimistic. A third approach, which is one that China's already beginning to experiment with, is one that's based on disclosure. This is, it's an experiment that's been run in a number of countries where you do not require the businesses that are causing the pollution in the course of their activities. You don't tell them they have to stop. You just tell them they have to report on what it is that they're emitting, what they're doing. This has become globally a very significant way of cleaning up environmental messes. And it works effectively in countries as diverse as all of the OECD countries. Mexico, Indonesia, a variety of others. But the reason that it works, and this is getting back to my opening point about the need to talk about social groups, the reason that it works is that you have NGOs, organized civil society actors, who are willing to say, we're going to look and see if all of these factories and all of these businesses are in fact reporting about the environmental damage they're doing. 
And then we're going to hold them accountable for what it is that they are emitting in the environment. It moves some of the regulatory burden off the public sector, and it engages the people sector in playing fundamental roles of cleaning up the environmental externalities that business activities are, are imposing. It can be extraordinarily effective because people, when they organize around environmental issues, are organizing around defending their own communities from being poisoned. And there is nothing <coughs> that motivates people like finding out that their schools are being polluted, their children are being threatened. It's, it can be a very, very effective way of bringing about a fairly rapid change. And as we heard this morning from some of the CEOs, most people in the business sector aren't particularly eager to be dumping environmental toxins on their communities. But they've never been forced to hold them to take those into account. They don't have the pricing mechanisms, there are no regulatory structures, and they're competing with other businesses that are not taking those environmental problems into account. So any system that can try to shake up that assumption that nature is free and natural resources are free and don't have to be dealt with is something that I think we're going to have to pay a lot of attention to. One last point. Um, it is very much true that business leaders would prefer to be doing the right thing rather than the wrong thing. There are systemic problems that make it difficult for business to do that. One of the biggest is the short-term financial focus, a financial system that says that you have to report every quarter on what kind of returns you are earning. The financial system that does not have a set of standards for taking into account long-term impacts, and therefore the long-term financial sustainability of the business. So the other set of actors besides the people sector that needs to be a part of this discussion on the future of Foshan and the future of all major cities is the financial industry. And this morning, we heard a conversation that was almost entirely divorced from that reality. And I hope that cities and other very concrete actors will be able to force that kind of conversation so that the financial sector becomes reintegrated with these broader discussions about how do you have sustainable growth in all senses. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we have a very clear demarcation, if you like, of the economic engine and the people sector and the physical environment, both in terms of the positive side of infrastructure and the negative side of contamination and pollution. Uh, and Shagun gets to pull this all together, but I would, I would hope, knowing what you've done in the study, that you might start a little bit with the way you've looked at the balance sheets of these three sectors and, and how they've been managed over time. This is a very interesting part of the analytical apparatus that FGI has put together. So we can think of the three towers, kind of the economical productive system, the social system, the physical and environmental system, and each of those having a balance sheet. And the experimentation, really how to govern those three, more or less in balance over time. Thanks, Dom. Uh, yeah, I actually learned a lot from this panel. You know, even though I spent a year uh, with uh, our team, you know, the 34 uh, it, uh, we, we actually have 14 teams uh, and, uh, with 24 people from Beijing and uh, the NDRC, the National Development Reform Commission, you know, working on this. Uh, this uh, uh, we get a lot of help from the Foshan, and, uh, including you know, Maji and other you know, uh, uh, enterprises and also local governments. You know. So it's a, uh, we learn a lot, you know, uh, we have a lot of surprises, you know. And uh, one thing we learned is what Dong mentioned, that the, the economic, social, uh, and the environmental issues are so closely linked, there's no way you can separate them. Uh, uh, but I, I was first trying to uh, give you the, uh, the sense, you know, when we first started this project, we actually uh, quite worried, you know. Foshan was not like a, a, a city like Shanghai, you know, exciting, you know. And when people uh, ask, ask, you know, why are you study Foshan? You know, 
uh, because Bosa has all, all these problems uh, in the challenges, uh, as pointed out by Professor Fong. You know, the industrial upgrading is uh, very, very challenging. You know, uh, one of the best companies, they, they, the revenues dropped like 20-30% uh, uh, in a year. You know? uh, and then the, uh, the so-called the governance, uh, all the uh, uh, you know, issues are just like well, anywhere in you know, or the country. People were actually quite pessimistic when we uh, did our uh, uh, interviews, uh, and uh, but we actually, after a year of study, you know, we got some very surprising results. Uh, first, what we discovered is that Fosun actually has per capita GDP at fifteen thousand US dollars, higher than Shanghai. Shanghai is about fourteen thousand US dollars. Uh, and according to the World Bank, the high income is 12,000 US dollars. So, Fortran already entered the high income group. Uh, that was really a surprise. You know. We discovered that at the end of research. Uh, uh, and the other surprise is that uh, uh, when we look at the, the Fortran actually has the uh, very sophisticated market, they have 36 specialized markets fully cut into the global supply chain. They have this furniture market and they're selling to you know, Middle East and Russia and, and uh, you know, everywhere in China. Uh, and when we enter those, one of those shops, it's like football studio. Uh, you feel like a football studio. You know, because all, uh, all the choices you, uh, I mean, you, you, can, uh, you can find. Uh, so, but when we dig deeper, who created this market? You know, all this market, uh, uh, we were amazed by this market, but when we asked the question, who created this market, we were actually surprised, because the, the, it starts from very early, you know, when uh, Professor Fong mentioned this contract, the tax contract system. Basically, the central government told the local, the Guangdong, say, okay, you just give me a fixed amount of tax, you can keep the rest. That, and the, the full time, Municipal government then tell the township, you know, district and the village government the same. You know, why don't you keep all your, 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 your tax, you know? And then you, why don't you use those tax to create market to build those, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, eventually those market which evolved into more than 30 industrial clusters. Uh, so, so what we have found is that it, actually it was the local government created the market allowed, uh, you know, later the township of rich enterprises, and those enterprises eventually listed, privatized, you know, and also uh, the locals attracted a lot of foreign direct investment. Uh, so that's another surprise, you know. We find actually convinced that the, the government is actually important in the development of the market. So that the state and the market are the two sides of the same coin. Now, that was a surprise. And it, it, it was uh, also a surprise when, you know, we started the study a year ago, but when the third plenum announced, you know, the party's decision, it looks surprisingly similar to our research framework. You know, we started by saying that the state, and the, we want to study the, the, the relationship between the, uh, the state and the market. And we, uh, our discovery from the four is that both are important, but the market is, of course, you know, uh, the most important. The, the government, what they should do is to provide the infrastructures, both hard infrastructure and soft inf infrastructure for the market. Uh, and that was actually our discovery from the four you know, because the four government uh, was trying very hard to make that transition from substituting the market to supporting the market. Uh, and then the last surprise I discovered only the day before yesterday. Yeah, the day before yesterday, uh, the Southern Weekly, Nanfang Zumo, the one of the most respected uh, papers in China, newspapers in China, did an interview you know, about our research. And they just uh, asked me, uh, how come, you know, Fosan can do this, but others cannot do this? So, 
And then I figured out, you know, during the interview, I said, uh, they have no choice. Because Bosan is a city uh, just very normal. Uh, yeah, nobody actually thinks that Bosan is, is so great. Uh, but exactly because of that. It's, it, it's not a city with special, I mean, special economic zone or, you know, or capital, uh, the capital of the province, you know, or a large city, or a city with natural resources, you know, or your coal, you know. Uh, so nothing. So basically it means that the, 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 the local government, out of no choice, uh, they decide to just try to develop the market. Uh, they don't even have people. You know, more than half of the population in Fosan today actually came from, you know, uh, outside of Fosan, the migrants. Uh, and the, the money, the investment also come from outside. Uh, so, so actually, uh, the, uh, the, uh, what it means is that the local government has nothing for rent seeking. There's no rent. They have to work hard. Uh, so so uh, th th this uh, actually are the three surprises. Uh, but in the process, when we do this research, you know, we really get excited. And I actually last, uh, last week, last, uh, you know, I, I was uh, visiting Foshan, you know, uh, together with some of uh, you know, the reporters, uh, foreign reporters, because they, they got interested in our study. Uh, and we met with the mayor. Uh, and the mayor told us, you know, because he, they, they, he saw our research, you know, he said, ah, I mean, your, I mean, basically he said, oh, did your study, are really objective and uh, uh, articulated so well, you know, he basically says he wants to let their colleagues to read. Because uh, uh, the, the people in Fosan, they just don't understand, you know, how uh, great you know, they are, you know, they, they, they've been doing, you know. And, and the, they, they, uh, when we were doing our research, they are getting lost. They are facing with a lot of challenges, you know, and, and they are very frank, telling us, you know, always, oh, most of, uh, you know, we, we uh, our interview is about problems, uh, but at the end of the day, when we put the data together, put the history together, and what we saw is a very successful story, and also at the end of the day, we suddenly figured out that they are actually not just the one city like Foshan. They are 17 cities in China with a population more than 3 million. They all have passed the World Bank high income threshold. And together, they have 11.5% of China's population, 29.1% of China's GDP. And if you look at this group of cities, I suddenly realized that this is really important. Because all those macro statistics doesn't matter. If this 17 cities continue, uh, if you look at our uh, working paper, uh, there's a graph, you know, you can look at four time. It's just uh, consistently growing faster, you know, than the country. And uh, we know China as a whole is growing so fast, right? But this 17 cities is performing so well uh, and that tells something, you know, because if you want to look at the future of China, China's future policies, we have to look at this pioneer cities. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah.
Uh, we started 15 minutes late, but we still have a half an hour for questions. You had a lot of panels talking at you. So this is your chance to make observations and ask questions of the panel. So we'll open it up. Yes, second row. Uh, what is the water situation? What's the water situation like there? Because I know in other parts of China, the statistic that most amazes me is that the, as vast as China is, it has only 1% of the world's water. Now, maybe because you've got a river there, it's, it's different, but the statistic that the the, uh, you know, just the amount of water to take to make these shirts seem like a lot. So I'm just in the, what is the water situation there? And is it sustainable? Yeah. This Hoshan,和水江。广州可能您知道广州大部分的饮水都是最近应该是五年之内才刚刚引到西江水 佛山在环境保护方面已初步实现了产业扭转移有升级corner of three rivers and not to face the challenges of many other places but nevertheless I heard you saying that you made significant efforts to conserve and improve the water situation Margie did you what what led the scale to really start push because you could have just sucked it out of the river right <laughs> Part of the water that I treat is for production. So the incoming water actually is not as good at quality as I think we would all like. I think you'll agree with me. But um, the water is too cheap. Unfortunately, this is a politically sensitive issue. I don't think government can raise the cost of the water. Um, we don't. We have the technology to 100% treat the water, but we can't uh, use that because incoming water is too cheap. Now, of course, it's, you say it's crazy for industry to say that water is too cheap. But if you look at, and I think I go back to Anne's point, is that you know, if you look at a macro situation, we're all going to die. Uh, this cannot be sustained. So this is something I think is a very delicate problem for the whole area. Water is still a very sensitive issue. Um, and then air quality is a big problem. You know, my, my, big, my big thing is still trying to shut down the polluting. It's coming from across the, um, the river. Now, um, we have very good relations with, uh, but I think, Anne, I'd like to tell you that 
we almost act as an NGO in a way because we live there. And because our company is now competing on talent and innovation, so the one thing we need all our people to feel is a sense of self-respect. And how do you gain a sense of self-respect is to recognize that your life is as important as anybody else's. Because early 35 years ago when we started, all started in industry, we all feel that because we're in industry, we have to put up with a lot of pain and put up with um, bad air quality, etc. But now, hey, we're telling ourselves, we're innovators. Therefore, as innovators, you must have a sense of self-respect. I am as good as anybody else. Therefore, I deserve to breathe air that is as fresh as anybody else would want. And my children deserve to have good water as anybody else's children. So, air quality today, frankly, is bad because I bike to work. And some mornings, my colleagues in Gaumi will say to me, boss, and they, that's because they think that I'm too old to put up with the, you know, if they can do it, I can't. But I'd like to, uh, I'd like to have air quality that even old people can bike to work and not have your colleagues worry and say, boss, maybe you should take the car. So um, I, I believe that, that 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 is a problem. But I think the mayor needs to be given some slack in GDP growth targets. The mayor wants to do something. And I genuinely believe, but if he's only given one KPI um, and not um, commented for being very brave and willing to tackle the um, issues related to the environment, then I think it's an opportunity missed. So I kind of like to see Forsan's growth numbers go down a bit so that the leadership there who has that, and I, I have a lot of respect for this leadership, I think they need to be cut a bit of slack so that they can do what they truly believe in. Um, I think I've just gone off track. Yeah, um, first of all, a, a quick comment on water. Australia is a very dry continent, and Australia prices water. Water is local, so it's a lot easier to put a price on local than it is to put a, something local that isn't, say, a price on carbon. You can do it. It works surprisingly well. I'd be interested, though, in the, in the throwaway uh, remarks of Xiao Geng at the end there about the, the, all the other cities, uh, the 17 cities in China that are providing such exceptional growth. Do you have any feel that all the growth models are the same, or that there's quite a wide variety? I know you haven't studied them in the same depth, probably, as you have in this one, but what would you expect to find if you went and looked at all these cities and in terms of the uh, yeah, Actually, uh, in our report, we said that the, uh, we, uh, the board, a, a lot of uh, practices in Foresight could be replicated and are replicated in other cities. So in that sense, yes, it's very similar. The growth models are more or less similar. But uh, I also realize that the performance cannot be replicated. You know, there's a lot of location, vector, you know, history, you know, it, it, it just cannot be replicated. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is that the, uh, the, uh, the I actually want to come back to the water, you know, the, uh, all the other cities, you know, they, they have brought the same point. And for, I think, Pearl River Delta actually uh, is better than the Yangtze River Delta, you know, in, in terms of pollution. But Foshan is actually the most polluted uh, cities you know, in Parallel Delta. And we wrote that in our report. And, and the mayor, you know, when I met him, you know, he admitted, you know, he re uh, restated and said, yes, it's right. Yeah. And one, uh, the, just like uh, the Marsh pointed out, the, the, the problem is, you know, the Foshan developed a, a lot of water processing capacity because that is very profitable. They sell water, process water into the industry. Uh, they also have the capacity to pro process uh, wastewater. But the trouble is that they uh, have not yet developed a, a system to collect wastewater. So the water, wastewater just you know, went to the river. 
And that is largely because the, uh, the standards set by the central government, you know, it, it, it's not there. The central government before, you know, they just they want GDP. So that's why the, uh, I mean, the local delivered GDP. Yeah. Uh, so I think going forward, you know, if that uh, is changed, and then enforcement uh, is actually effective, then uh, I think that uh, my feeling is that from the leaders, from the you know enterprises, and from the local people, they all want to have actually fresh air and clean water. Uh, and if you look at the, what the, uh, uh, Director Xu, you know, he is actually in charge of one of the, the latest uh, new town development. They actually uh, took that into consideration. You know, they are building eight miles of green bell. You know, uh, and we were there. We were surprised. Look, this looks, the, uh, those places looks like Singapore. You know, very. Uh, I mean, I, I actually want to move there. I mean, the, the, uh, looks very. Uh, I mean, pleasant. Yeah, but of course, I'm not sure the, the, the water and the, the air are as clean as in Singapore. So now we've got uh, two of the platforms, at least in, in active motion, right? We're, we're amazed by this income per capita, but suddenly seeing that, so we've got some of the worst pollution that goes along with that. One of the other pieces I've heard about this story is that, and maybe Xu Ping can tell us a little bit more early on, you did a wonderful job at attracting migrants. But now, a lot of effort on allowing them to upgrade themselves through vocational education, et cetera. So what can you tell us about the upgrading of the people platform, just briefly? Same similar experience 
within America, because in America, the city basically managed themselves. Do you do one find a similar pattern? Want to spring for that? For me, uh, uh, if you look at the, this, the first five-year plan and also the third plan, you know, the, uh, and, the whole, and also the speech by the Chinese leaders, you know, they already put forward several KPIs. Uh, and as to your second question, I don't think so. You know, the, the Chinese systems are clearly different from the U.S. system. The, uh, if you look at the, the, the party, actually controls the uh, uh, what, what we call the people, you know, the, the officials. You know, there's a party system uh, disciplining the local officials, and, uh, you know, especially like a corruption. You know. it, it's very, uh, I would say, uh, Chinese characteristic. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and also the, uh, the local government uh, in China, it, it, it looks more like a corporation than the American cities. American cities are also an economic entity. You know, they, they, they can sometimes go bankrupt. But in China, there are 287 cities, and each of them has dual role, you know, both as a government, but also they, under them, there are a few dozen uh, uh, so called uh, local government financing vehicles. You know, they basically are companies sort of providing infrastructure. You know, the, the, uh, so, so it's very, very different from, from what I understand. Very, very different, but let me, let me take the can down the road a little bit. I said, fascinating to take the lenses that this team has developed on Foshan City and apply that to a U.S. city. Obviously, we're managed in a different way, but the three platforms come together much more sharply at the city level than they do at the national level. The Boston mayoral election we just had was about education and about economic opportunity, and the environment comes up there. At the national level, these things are totally detached. At the city level, people see them as interacting very interesting to compare at these levels. Um, Margie, quickly, and then we have a hand back here. Well, I was going to say that we should all lobby the Film Institute to lobby for a balanced scorecard approach so that there would be more than one KPI for um, Chinese uh, cities and even uh, all other levels. That would be, if the Film Institute could do that, it would be doing all mankind a tremendous favor. Let me put in a little commercial for the Fung Institute's approach. I think the, the, first, the first point before lobbying for the balanced scorecard is documenting how the city is doing on the different elements of the scorecard, right? Making it clear that you can't just judge 15,000 per capita. You must also look at the physical environment. You must also look at the social setting. Document how this has worked. From that comes the advocacy for let's have a balanced shoulder. But let's see what's happening first. Uh, in the I back put it, uh, one word on the cities. Not yes. Fairly recent from the United States is that the cities in the a lot of cities in the United States, after going downhill for decades, are experienced a renaissance, and that's because local leadership is determinedly non-ideological and problem-solving. While as we heard at the lunch, the national leadership, if you want to call it that, in the United States, has become totally ideological. Right. So let's not look at a country just up here. Let's look at a country down here as well. I think Kulas in the in the back. Yeah. Um, this picks up really from what the gentleman just said about the decline as well as the out. Uh, I've got a question for Marjorie, if I, if I might. Uh, I was very struck by what you said. You employed thirty thousand people and uh, moving from competing on cost to competing on innovation, differentiation, and, and talent. But you still have the cost, and as the cost in China goes up, as the R and B appreciates you will no doubt face increasing pressure on you to shift jobs offshore. So as that pressure comes on you as a business looking forward 5, 10, 15 years, how do you think about that process? And then how do you, does your relationship with the state government change? Because you may well decide to shift 10,000 jobs to Bangladesh. It's not my graduate school, it's my undergraduate school that really taught me how to do this. So. Thank you. 
It's not how much you pay the people. It's whether they're, they're worth the money you pay them. So if we manage better, their productivity goes up. There's no problem. You go to a very poor place, you don't have middle management. Here, we're totally changing the game. We have, this is the trick. So with China's economic reform, Deng Xiaoping, he also advocated education. So there are six million university graduates. We are able to take advantage of that talent pool. We're even trying to upgrade supervisors. We're in certain new factories, we are going to take advantage of not even using um, uh, the traditional no gong, the workers. But it's how we manage. So, using mobility, how much productivity gain can you get that worker who, who is basically the same person? And our argument is a lot. You can say, using a mobile phone alone, you can just save them a lot of time. And I can take it offline with you. We started using 3D printing. Um, we started using mobility. We started using a lot of technology focused on productivity gain. We're using the mobile phone to teach people. My daughter's favorite thing is, do you know how many unwanted pregnancies there are and this is not because of rape, but purely because young girls don't know how to take care of themselves. That's a productivity loss. We can do so much with an educated management that I cannot get in Bangladesh. I cannot get in a lot. Even in Vietnam, we're in Vietnam, we're in a lot of the other countries. Only in China do we have the luxury. Now, the question is, can we as management change our game and our mindset to deal with these very problems and all these smart young guys, you know, it's a lot to manage them. Are we willing to change our own way of managing a very docile workforce but paid very little? Change our game to managing a group of very bright young people, educated, asking, always constantly asking stupid questions. But are we willing to do that? And uh, I think, the, uh, of course, my belief is that you can. And that's why we are trying to show that the coastal area has still got competitiveness, but it's a totally different kind of competitiveness. Okay, we have time for one last question. Richard, you were in line long, long ago. I think several people who, who are wanting to get in, you'll have to stay for the following session because this continues on Foshan, and you'll hopefully be able to get in on that round. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panel for a very uh, exciting study. Um, I think I would like to just preface my remarks. I think Western social science has done a lot to understand the market, why it works, and why it certain, sometimes don't work so well. We do it, we understand very well. Fixing why it doesn't work is more challenging. Now, we understand a lot less about how states function. Now, why and why in your study, in Fosan and similar studies, uh, why were incompatible incentives made compatible? How did they solve this? Why, why were the officials motivated? Why did they respond? Most don't. Uh, uh, what we can do you tell us? I, I would say a few words. Professor Fung yeah. it, it's actually very uh, simple, you know. It, it's the competition. They, they, they first decentralized the, the, the autonomy, you know, the local power to the lowest level, and then they have to compete. At the same time, they have to cooperate because they are responsible, responsible for collective action. And then they also have to compete with the other, you know, towns, you know, districts, and cities. Just a very quick remark. You know, I think uh, we are ignoring some of the. The sun is not just a, you know, it's not. It has a tremendous history. It is, in fact, 
um, the center of um, Guangdong province before Guangzhou. Guangzhou is a trading uh, background. The sun is very deep rooted. A lot of the Lingnan Wenhua is the culture is there. So it's got a lot of potential for what we're looking for in innovation, etc. So whereas you can see the coastal like Dongwen, etc., they go for uh, uh, just gabo um, um, just uh, processing. Fatsan is able to, um, we find it easier to work in Fatsan and to do more research, more design, more development work than a lot of people in the um, uh, processing zones. So, so I think uh, three, three things before we conclude. There are copies of the case study over there. There are copies of the Chinese Institutional Change and Structural Transformation booklet. And you're not supposed to leave without filling out your evaluation form. I think we got a wonderful picture of the, some of the complexity of the infrastructure of this fascinating city. Uh, we have a 15 to 20 minute break. Then we'll come back here, hear more about Foshan. Thank you. Thank you, panel, very much.